Around the world, millions of people are reported missing every year, and while most of these are solved and in a timely manner, for others this is not the case at all. Some of these disappearances happen under bizarre circumstances and are less clear. Let's begin with the disappearance from the UK, or within England specifically. If you're familiar with my coverage of Gaia Pope, linked above and in the description, who disappeared from Swanage in 2017. While many years prior, this one occurred around 30 miles to the north in Salisbury. This happened to John Johnson, who was three years old on the 21st of June, 1955. On that particular day, John and some members of his family were holidaying together and camping, which is something their family seemed to love doing in the English countryside. John, as far as I can tell, was the youngest person there, and his sister and cousin went on a walk that day to head to the shops which were about a mile away from camp. On the way to the shop, the two girls were playing with John, and as they got closer, they had what was supposed to be a playful race to the finishing line. This, as it turns out, was not a good idea, as when they turned around to check on John, he'd vanished. This seemed to have confused the girls at first, because there wasn't really anywhere for John to have gone, as it appears that they were all heading in a mostly straight line on one trail. They shouted for him, and searched for him, but they couldn't find him. And from what I can tell, this seems to have led to suspicions that John might have been taken, even though they hadn't seen anyone at all. This was reported two days into the search. There was still no trace early today of John Johnson missing on Salisbury Plain since Tuesday afternoon. Police and troops resumed the search again at 6am. In yesterday's search, called off at dusk, 600 men from the Highland Light Infantry and 100 police were aided by helicopters, army spotting planes and dogs. After the race, the boy has not been seen since. Today, police at Salisbury discussed the suggestion that an undergarment found yesterday belonged to the boy. They believe that the boy has wandered a long distance or has gone into hiding and is too frightened to move. This piece of clothing turned out to have nothing to do with John. Now, John was found, but it wasn't without its peculiarities. The sunburnt John Johnson toddled out of a field near the Hampshire-Wiltshire border shortly before 8am today. He was restored to his mother, appearing well and not unduly concerned. Not unduly concerned, yet he had been lost for three nights and two days on rugged Salisbury Plain. He had wandered four or five miles away through rough country and over the top of Beacon Hill, one of the highest points on the plain to Park House. This was something that surprised the searchers because they didn't know how he'd managed such a steep climb all by himself. But unfortunately, that was given short shrift, which tends to happen when people are just happy that the lost are found safe and sound. I feel that it may have been worth a little more discussion though, and I'm sure there probably were discussions that took place behind closed doors because it could indicate that there may have been involvement from another person. In any case, after being found, officers asked him how he'd spent the last three days, but he unfortunately wasn't able to delve into specifics. But what he did have to say was quite odd. He said that he'd met another boy who hit him, that he slept in a tree, and the articles all phrase this next part differently some simply say that, quote, he muttered something about a dog and a horse. Others say that he played with the dog and horse, and one stated that he was talking with the dog and horse. Nothing more could be found about this boy he spoke of, and it's hard to imagine what was going on there. He met another boy in the middle of nowhere? Was he hallucinating these events? It's not really clear. But one way or another, he sure seemed to manage and finish a very unlikely journey. Any hope of getting Johnny's story from him was quickly dashed. He was tired, hungry and thirsty, and could say nothing of his adventures beyond a few disjointed phrases. I slept in a tree, a boy hit me, was all he said beyond muttering something about a dog. His clothes were in a shocking state, dirty and torn to pieces. 
His body was all reddened, looking like exposure to the sun. But all else we could see wrong with him were a few scratches on his legs and head. Those are basically the final words on John's disappearance. I suppose the main thing was that he was found, but I'd sure like to hear more about this other boy, and perhaps how he spent the nights. And actually, frankly, how he disappeared so quickly. In any case, given that's the end of the paper trail, let's explore the next disappearance. Tyler Wright was 35 years old when he disappeared from the Boise Creek Trail in Unk, British Columbia, Canada, on the 10th of August, 2010. At the time, Tyler was on a five-day solo hike that would take him through the Coquitlam and Indian Arm area. Unfortunately though, Tyler seemed to have made a pretty big mistake right off the bat. The earliest articles take us to around a week into the official search effort. Squamish Royal Canadian Mounted Police say the 35-year-old is not an experienced mountain hiker and did not take a sleeping bag, tent or compass with him into the woods. He was wearing running shoes when he was dropped off at Boise Creek Trail near Squamish on the 10th of August. It's not really clear to me why he made that decision, perhaps he just intended to sleep rough. I have no idea, but that's certainly not something that should be recommended. Tyler was a very strong and big guy standing at 6 foot 4. He was said to be competent in the outdoors and could look after himself well enough. He did take food packs and water with him and when he was reported missing 8 days later by his family, the authorities thought he could last for as long as a month out in this area with the provisions he had. The search for Tyler entered its 8th day on Wednesday after crews discovered more evidence that the missing hiker could still be alive. Searchers are now concentrating on an area called Bull Creek near Squamish, BC, a day after crews located a 15 meter long slide path down a rock face. They think Tyler tried to climb up out of the creek bed but slid back down instead. While this was suspected as evidence of Tyler's recent presence, they went completely sure up until they found the next clue. Size 16 footprints believed to be Tyler's were found in the creek bed near the slide area, confirming for rescuers that he continued on from there. Tyler wore a very large shoe size, making his prints fairly unique, and there was nothing else that the searchers believed could have left them. So with that, they now had a strong lead and a focal point to direct the search to. The distinctively large impressions were first found along the Boise Creek Trail near the Bull Bull last week, and more prints were found Monday afternoon. Searchers are now working the Valley Creek bed where they found the impressions, but have described the terrain as heinous and difficult to traverse. These footprints, while already difficult to follow because of the hazardous area, they would come to peter out and they just couldn't be followed any further and the trail was lost. Search dogs trailed this area up and down but they could never establish a scent for some reason and unfortunately that wasn't expanded upon. Not far from the end of the footprint trail, they found a patch of flattened vegetation which likely means that Tyler had been laying down right there. It's unlikely that this was just a fall into that spot, as that wouldn't flatten it to the degree that it was. Instead, it highlights that Tyler had been there for a while, though we'll never fully know why. The likelihood is that he was sleeping there, or he may have been hiding from an animal. I believe that bears are active in this area, though there was no evidence at all of animal predation, so it's unlikely, as bears aren't known to be discreet and any evidence left behind by such an event would have been completely clear to the searchers. To add to the search effort, there were helicopters in the air using thermal imaging technology, including one that the family had rented privately with high resolution cameras. From what I can tell, all footage of this was uploaded to a blog run by the family in the hopes that someone might spot something in the footage that had been missed. But despite over 12,000 people being involved in that effort, it just seems that the footprints led nowhere and he vanished after that. The search reached its end after 12 days didn't provide any further evidence of Tyler's presence. 
One of the largest ground searches ever conducted in British Columbia has been suspended after 12 days of searching failed to find any trace of a missing hiker who set off alone into the rugged mountains north of Vancouver. Search teams logged 5,000 hours covering 200 square kilometers of rugged mountain terrain without success. Because of the slide patch, the footprints and the evidence of laying down or sleeping in the area, officers made it clear that they fully believed that they were on the right track, but were surprised when they couldn't locate anything further. Corporal Dave Ritchie added, It's a mountain hike, but I don't think it's established all the way through. It shows it's connected to both ends of a trail, but we're not really sure if it is. I don't know if he got into something more than he thought he was going into. That's very interesting, and perhaps I'm taking it the wrong way here, but from what I can tell, he's essentially saying that this trail might not be fully mapped, or correctly mapped at least. That wasn't expanded upon, but you'd think that the search effort would reveal the answer to that in the end. But one way or another, Tyler, nor any trace of him after the footprints, was ever found. Boots on the ground, nor the search dogs, or the thermal imaging cameras could provide any further answers. We're almost 12 years from the date of the disappearance, and nothing has ever turned up. So what happened to Tyler, and where did he go? Now, let's move on to Australia. On the 5th of June in 2011, something unusual would happen on Mount Stirling, located in the Victorian Alpine National Park. On that particular day, a well-known and well-respected man by the name of David Prudhoe, who was the head of the Bowen Correctional Facility. At this point in his life, David did have a history of having to manage high blood pressure, which he was taking medication for. But aside from that, he was said to be in generally good health, David had many skills and passions, including hunting and being in the outdoors, which he partook in a lot over the years. The day before he vanished on this mountain, he left his home to meet his brother-in-law in Mansfield, where they would finalise plans for their trip. The idea was to spend several days together hunting deer, and they chose Tomahawk Hut, which is near a ski area on Mount Sterling. It's important to note that while David was incredibly skilled and knowledgeable about the outdoors and in wilderness areas, this isn't a place that he was familiar with, and from what I can tell, may have been his first time at this location. In any case, they arrived at the hut around midday on the 4th, and they scouted the area together, looking for various places in which they could set up. After they found a couple of places that they were happy with, the pair went back to the hut and slept until the following morning. This now would be the day that David came to disappear. On the morning of the 5th of June, the pair set off at 7.45am to commence hunting, wearing thermals, camouflage clothing and carrying backpacks. That included small thermos of coffee and a number of energy bars. Both carried a UHF radio and David also carried a GPS navigation device, but no map on the area. He did not take his mobile phone, which was left in his vehicle at the campsite. After walking in a northerly direction for some time, they followed their plan to separate. For safety reasons, the brother-in-law went down a valley moving to the right, while David went to Penol in the northwesterly direction. This was the last known sighting of David, it's understandable at a glance why David may have left his phone behind. He probably wasn't expecting to have any signal. However, I would never advise doing that because in such an instance that you do happen to get lost, it may be crucial in being found. Sometimes you might find a pocket in which there is a signal, even if it's weak and intermittent. And in that case, if the signal wasn't stable, you could change your voicemail to declare that you're lost and try to explain where exactly. To go along with that, you could also use the what 3 words app. And no, that's not a sponsor. But this is an app that gives every 3 meters square in the world a unique 3 word address. Meaning that if you were to leave that in a voicemail, you'd make it much easier to be found. Anyway, moving on from that tip. The brother-in-law returned to the hut about four hours later at 11.30am 
and he wasn't worried initially when David wasn't there, as the pair hadn't agreed a time to meet, which was the second mistake. At around 4.30pm, the brother-in-law tried to ping David over the radio across multiple channels, but there was no response. While he was becoming more uneasy at this point, the pair had planned to collect firewood before the evening. So he set out to do that in the hopes that he might be able to contact David, who he thought was probably just out doing this already. Now, upon nightfall is where the panic really set in, as he still hadn't heard a word from David. At this point, he took a bright torch along the trail that he would have expected to have reconnected with David, if David had followed the route properly. He shone the torch into the bushland and made more attempts at contacting David, but there was radio silence, quite literally. The radio was now turned onto scan mode and he requested that if David can't respond over the radio, he should make another attempt at making his presence known, such as using his hunting gear directly up into the air. This never happened though, and the brother-in-law never heard anything that would reveal David's location. At this stage, he rushed back to the hut and reported David as missing at 8.45pm that night. Police arrived at 9.45pm in conditions they described as atrocious with it being cold, raining heavily, and very windy. Snow was forecast for the area, down to about 800 metres, with that being 300 metres below the elevation of the hut. After meeting with the brother-in-law, and an hour of further searching, it was realised the search needed to be escalated. That search would begin at 8.15am the following morning, with professional searchers now out scouring the area, while more and more personnel would pour in throughout the day from all over the place. Searchers made it clear immediately that this was not a good place to get lost in, because they noted that the area was incredibly steep and rugged mountainous terrain with rocky cliffs and long steep slopes. The problem though is that David was supposed to be following a trail to his location, and it wasn't at all clear as to why he would venture off this trail into this kind of terrain. The entire area was covered in thick vegetation, and it was stated that the surroundings were impenetrable, which was a particularly interesting description by the searchers. Because it raises the question, if these areas were practically impenetrable, what was David doing at the time, and why did he enter? David had a means of defending himself at the time, so it's unlikely that he was pushed in that direction by some kind of predator, unless he was completely blindsided. This didn't seem to make much sense though, given the circumstances, because there was no evidence of this left behind at all. The Victoria Police Air Wing flew continuously throughout the day. In the following days, deteriorating weather conditions, including fog and snow dumps, impeded both aerial and ground searching. So, it seems that this began to turn into the perfect storm of disastrous events, all happening at the worst time possible in an area that already provided the search effort with complex issues to overcome. Despite extensive search efforts over a number of days, including searches undertaken by canine teams, the searchers failed to find any equipment, clothing, food wraps, or footprints belonging to David. The search continued until the 10th of June, when at the end of that day's searching, the decision was made to suspend it. Presumably, this happened because it became increasingly dangerous to search the area, and in all likelihood, given the severity of the conditions described, it was probably deemed as unviable by medical personnel that a person could make it for that length of time in such conditions. Further search operations did occur though later that month, and then again in September, October, and November of 2011, with nothing ever being found. No tangible piece of evidence was obtained to suggest that David met with foul play, nor was any physical evidence located to suggest his disappearance was manufactured. Both Sergeant McPherson and Detective Senior Sergeant Idles believed that David had passed away. They further believe that there was a major medical event or a serious accident that caused him to be incapable of movement or communication whilst hunting. The problem with this conclusion for some though, was that it was argued that if such a medical event had taken place, then he should have been found. The case was made 
that he wouldn't have been able to venture into these impenetrable areas as described by the search leaders, that were well off the beaten path. There were other irregularities too, including accusations of foul play, but as said, ultimately no evidence of this ever surfaced, so let's move on to something else. Two clairvoyants claimed to know where he was, and there began to be supposed sightings of the missing prison boss. One hunter claimed to have seen David 15 miles away on the Zekaspur track, a place familiar to David's family. But the snow came in and the search was called off. The search resumed again that year, over nearly 50 square kilometres. Not a trace of him was found. That Christmas, a story appeared in a Melbourne newspaper that stated it was likely that his remains had been eaten by wild dogs, which spread bones over several kilometres. That doesn't seem like a particularly well thought out suggestion though, because if that had happened, where did the clothing go and all of his hunting equipment? None of it was ever found. Because of how puzzling this disappearance was, some began to speculate that David may have faked the whole thing. Some people began saying that they'd seen him and that he was on the run, but these speculations have been investigated and discounted by authorities. The final conclusions of this disappearance is that David was claimed by the forest, which is likely to be the case. But it's unusual that not a shred of evidence, clothing, etc. ever turned up. What do you think? Now, let's move to Israel to explore the next disappearance. Dr. James Pike, 56 years old at the time, disappeared in the Judean wilderness in Israel on the 1st of September, 1969. James was an elected bishop of San Francisco 11 years prior to that date and resigned from the role in 1966. After he stepped down, it seems he was drawn to a more scientific field because he became a researcher at the Centre for the Study of Democratic Institutions, though I'm not sure exactly what he was doing there. On the day that James disappeared, he and his wife were driving through this desert wilderness area when their car broke down at the worst possible time that night. The desert hadn't quite cooled down yet and the two set out on foot to look for help but James collapsed around two hours after walking in the heat. His wife went on alone, and she said that she left him on a hillside. After walking all night, Mrs. Pike met some highway guards early Tuesday, and they took her to Bethlehem. The police immediately began a search using helicopters and planes. James's car was found Tuesday afternoon. Searches today, found the passport and wallet of Dr. James Pike in the barren Judean wilderness northwest of the Dead Sea. Army officials said Pike's belongings were found in a dry riverbed or wadi about a mile east of his abandoned car. The officials said they expected to find Pike soon, though they weren't sure in what condition that might be. The finding of these items immediately raised alarm bells because it wasn't where his wife left him. Speaking of, we actually get some more context surrounding the moment of disappearance. Mrs. Pike told police she and her husband were doing research on a book and decided to drive through the desert for a few hours to get the feel of the Judean Hills. She said that the car got stuck in rocks and boulders about 3pm and they were unable to free it despite trying for about two hours. Then. The couple set out on foot towards the Dead Sea. After two hours of walking, James complained of leg pains and told his wife to go on without him. I suggested that he take a nap and when he got his strength to follow me. I left him atop a small mountain about six or seven miles west of the Dead Sea. So it seems that James at some point must have began to feel a little bit better and felt that he could continue onwards in the direction his wife took. What was particularly surprising for the searchers though, was that after finding his belongings two days into the search, they were certain that they must have been close to him. But James hadn't left any indications of where he'd gone. There were no footprints to follow and their search dogs couldn't find a scent. As a result of this, troops, policemen and airplanes 
become the Judean desert again today for Dr. James Pike. But officials held out little hope that he could have survived through these conditions for three days. 200 soldiers and troops began the search for James on Tuesday, on foot and in the air. Later, they found a map in a dry riverbed about a mile east of the car and Mrs. Pike said her husband had been carrying it before they were separated. There were four theories to explain James's disappearance. That he had taken refuge in one of the many caves in the area to escape daytime temperatures of more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That he had fallen victim to a beast of prey. That he had succumbed to the heat and that his body was beneath some overhanging cliff. That he had been found by nomads and taken to one of their camps. All of these possibilities had been explored and they quickly surmised that there were absolutely no signs or any evidence pointing to animal predation. Nor was James at any of the caves in the area, leading to the authorities to say, and I quote, that they are puzzled by the circumstances surrounding the disappearance. That was said because somehow in this desert area, James hadn't left any tracks behind at all. Twice, they thought that they were nearing his location, but there was just no sign of him anywhere. Around 300 police and soldiers pulled out of the search in its fourth day, leaving behind 30 veteran army scouts who were aided by the local Bedouin tribesmen and trackers who knew the land better than anyone. Police sources said one of the mysterious aspects in the case was the failure by the Bedouin trackers to find any traces of Pike, although his wife pointed out what she said was the exact spot where she left her husband after their car broke down. The point was made by the authorities and the trackers that they expected to find James's camera and sunglasses, but they never did. It would be natural for a man staggering across the wilderness looking for help to abandon such useless items. The question is, why haven't we found them? Spiritualists in different parts of the world envision the former bishop lying in a cave somewhere in the Judean wilderness. These spiritualists, more than 5,000 miles apart, have come up with the same vision that James is alive, but not conscious. They say he is in a cave whose entrance is obscured by a bush. Before he entered the cave, James marked a rock beside the entrance with a scratch to indicate his whereabouts, Mrs. Pike said. I'm not sure that information was of any help to the trackers and army scouts, but they did try to look for this supposed cave, but they never found it. Though I suppose it's odd that these people miles apart from one another were envisioning the same thing. Now, James's body was found six days after he disappeared, around three miles from the spot Mrs. Pike had left him, nowhere near a cave. They found his clothes strewn around, but his pants were closer towards the car than any of the other items that they'd found. The searchers said that they weren't sure how they'd missed them previously, and making that even weirder, they believed that he only lived for hours after the pair split up. Perhaps an animal or something moved them later, that's not really clear. The cause of James's passing was also somewhat confusing to read about too. One article stated that it was due to a head injury, Another said that it was thirst, and one stated a heart attack. So it seems that the cause doesn't really seem to be completely clear either. That's also practically the end of the paper trail. I'd just like to take the time to thank you for watching, and a big thank you to the patrons who've been running around and disappearing on the screen. If you found the video interesting, then please do leave a like, hit the bell, and subscribe if you haven't already. If not, then feel free to leave a dislike, I'm just looking for your honest opinion either way. I hope that you've had a great day, or evening, depending on where you are, and I'll see you in the next one. Be safe guys. Peace.